what I'm going to do is, is give you a little bit of a taste of how we are exploring planets beyond our solar system. I'm an explorer, but I don't go anywhere. My avatars are telescopes and space satellites and instruments. The only thing that's actually traveling are the photons of light coming from distant points in our galaxy and for other types of research elsewhere in the universe. So the question I want to start with is, why am I up here? I know why you're all there. You're here to exchange ideas about innovation. But why is you know, a space scientist, an astrophysicist, a rocket scientist up here? Maybe I could tell you about innovation of technology. And you've heard a little bit about that. But what I'd like to argue is that every innovation of technology is only the first step of innovation. It's only one type of innovation. Because whenever we are able to see our world, however big our world happens to be, for me it's really big, we are surprised. We find stuff we never, ever expected. And that leads to innovation of awareness. Now, actually, innovation of awareness is just another way of saying learning. Except innovation of awareness has like eight syllables, and learning has only two syllables for a scientist. I really like innovation of awareness as a technical term. And that leads to perspective and context. That leads to understanding, and that's what leads to transformation. And I truly believe that 400 years from now, if there are universities and schools, if there are textbooks, if there are documentaries, if, if there are students, if there are people, they will look back at this time, this past century, even this particular decade, in the same way that we look back four centuries to the time of Galileo. It's that kind of revolution in our awareness of our universe and of ourselves. So before I start, to tell you a little bit about searching for and studying other planets, I have to basically ask the question, why should we look for planets? And should we look for planets? And then when I pose that question to people, I get two responses almost all the time from everybody from ages 8 to 80. One response is to look for life elsewhere. Do we have any neighbors? Are there aliens? The other is to look for a place that we can escape to, to evacuate to in case we screw up this place. Well, I have to tell you, as a space scientist, that our ability to screw up this place is far more advanced than our ability to travel to another place. There hasn't been a single human being that has gone as far as the planet Mars in our own solar system, let alone seven billion of us. And so the reason that we're looking for other planets isn't to look for an escape route. The reason that we study other suns and other worlds is to better understand our own sun and our own world and how they interact. And that's part of the message that I hope to convey to you. Let me put things in perspective. Context and perspective is very important. Go back to before the 13th of March, 1781. There were only six planets known that you could see without a telescope. In the sky, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and, if you look down, the Earth. After that date, thanks to uh, British royal astronomer William Herschel, there were seven the planet Uranus was added to the list. Notice very carefully how I pronounce the name of that planet, by the way. We've gone through all of, oh, they found Klingons around Uranus jokes. Uh, it's actually pronounced Uranus. In 1930, an American astronomer, Clyde Tombaugh, brought the list up to nine with the discovery of the planet Pluto out in the outer reaches of the solar system as it was recognized then. In 1992, two astronomers Alex Voltson and Dale Frail, Dale Frail, a Canadian, using radio techniques, found planets, in a technical sense, around the corpse of an exploded star, a rapidly spinning neutron star, a pulsar. Not the place where we'd expect to find planets, not the place where we expect to find life, 
but these would qualify as the first planets found outside of our solar system. Total 11. After this date, 1995, the total went up to 12, with the discovery of the kind of planet that you would think of as a planet around the kind of star that you would think of as like the sun, and it was, in fact. A sun-like star, 51 Pegasi A, and the planet, 51 Pegasi B. We're not very good at naming planets, I have to say. <laughs> now, how was this found? Not by taking a picture. Planets are faint. Hey, even in our own solar system, we can only see a few without a telescope. The Voyager 1 spacecraft, from a point uh, only essentially 20 times further away from the sun than we are right now, looked back and took a picture of the Earth. And that's it. Carl Sagan called it the pale blue dot. That's from a distance of 300 billion kilometers. Sounds a long way away by human standards. Now imagine trying to take a picture of an Earth around another star, one of our nearest neighbors, 20 light years away, one and a half million times further away, at a distance of 90 million billion kilometers. We, we can't do that. So how do we find planets? Well, it has to do with gravity. Planets and stars aren't nailed down in space. And so a planet like the Earth and the Sun are interacting with each other. It's a mutual attraction. Don't worry, it's purely physical. And <laughs> as the Earth orbits around the Sun and, and the Sun pulls on the Earth, well, the Earth is pulling on the Sun at the same time. So they're both actually moving. It's just the Sun isn't moving very much. Now, stars and planets are generally round, almost spheres. They orbit in a mathematical shape called an ellipse, uh, an oval. Uh, but what they're really doing is kind of a square dance. It's planets are literally dancing with the stars. And what, there's just two partners here, except one partner is very heavy and the other partner isn't so heavy. And so what's happening is essentially the, the massive partner, the star, is wobbling around as its lower mass partner, the planet, is swinging in a wide arc. And they're both actually orbiting around a common point between them called the center of mass. And in fact, that point could even be inside the star. In the case of our sun, it's a point just on the edge, just outside of the sun. So this is how we detect unseen planets, too faint to be seen even with our most powerful telescopes, is by the wobble that they induce by their orbit in their parent star. And this is a really good idea, and it's a Canadian idea. This idea was developed and first applied right here. My friends and colleague Gordon Walker at UBC uh, now retired and living in Victoria. And Bruce Campbell, a young astronomer at the University of Victoria, who is now in private consulting, were the ones who came up with the way to actually detect planets around stars for the first time. And they actually found the first planet, but they were very cautious as scientists and didn't make a definitive claim, although in retrospect it is now known that they found that planet. The first people to find a planet that everybody recognized very soon are these fellows, Michel Mayor and Didier Calos, uh, Swiss astronomers from the Observatoire de Genève. And they found 51 Pegasi B, you know, a name only an alien mother could love, but we're stuck with that. And so after that date in November 1995, the total of planets went up to 12, thanks to this Doppler wobble technique. By the summer of 2006, the total had gone up to over 200. And here's a little map, kind of a 3D perspective, no avatar 3D, but a 3D perspective showing uh, a few of our neighbors, stars that are known to have planets, and a scale, 51 Pegasi, 50 light years away. Takes light 50 years to reach us from that star and from the planet orbiting around that star. After the 24th of August, 2006, the number went down by one. Uh, when the International Astronomical Union demoted Pluto. Uh, I was there in Prague. Uh, I, I voted, uh, I didn't vote against Pluto, not because I didn't think it deserved to be deplaneted, but because I thought if you're gonna rewrite the textbooks, you wanna have more than eight days to think about how you're gonna rewrite them. 
As of this afternoon, talking about ripped from today's headlines, the total is 547 confirmed planets around other stars that we call exoplanets, and about 1,200 candidates. Well, if we're going to talk about planets elsewhere, let's come back closer to home. The planets in our own solar system, shown here to scale in size, and the new category of dwarf planets, uh, of which Pluto is the prototype. And astronomers like myself ask questions like, how were the planets born? How have they changed since then? How does our planet Earth interact with the sun and vice versa, and what's the future? Of our Earth. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to ask these kinds of questions. Anyone has thought about these kinds of questions in the past. Well, if you want to answer those questions, you really need a big sample. Because until recently, we only had one example of a planetary system. That's our own. And if you really want to understand the Earth, if you really want to understand the Sun, you need to have other planetary systems. You've got to expand that sample to more than one. And in the process of expanding that sample, we have literally been rewriting the textbooks. Now, if you want to rewrite a textbook, you need a pen. Well, I actually have more than one pen. I, my students, and my colleagues have four exquisite pens. These are my pens for rewriting the textbooks. They're pens that draw what an astronomer would call light curves. And they're capable of ultra-precise photometry, measurements of the brightnesses of stars. The first of these pens, the Pioneer, is a Canadian pen. Most, and you'll hear more about it in a few minutes, it's Canada's first space telescope. Uh, most has had babies, uh, which haven't been launched yet. Bright Constellation, Bright Target Explorer, uh, which will go into orbit soon. The French joined us in space three and a half years after most was launched with a project called Corot. And the little satellite here isn't really all that little. It's just it's further away from the Earth than any of the others. And it's the American project, NASA's Kepler satellite. And uh, these are the pens with which we're rewriting the textbooks. But most was the pioneer. This would have seemed like science fiction to me when I was a starting student 30 years ago, when I was starting to say that I couldn't have dreamed that there would be four space missions dedicated to this kind of research and that I'd be in charge of one of them. And we are in a transformative time in which we are learning about the nature and lives of stars, including our sun, and the nature and lives of planets, including our Earth. Another way to look for planets and to study them, not this wobble technique, is known as the transit technique. If you're lucky enough to have a planet whose orbit carries it in front of the star, from our point of view, then it basically blocks a little bit of the light from the star. It's not an eclipse, because it's not big enough to block out the whole disk of the star. We call it a transit. They happen in our solar system, but obviously only for planets which are closer to the sun than we are, at least if you want to see it from Earth. Mercury undergoes transits. Venus undergoes transits. And the most recent one occurred on the 8th of June, 2004. The previous one was 1882. So on the 7th of June, 2004, there wasn't a single human being alive who had ever witnessed a transit of Venus with his or her own eyes. I was in much hool in England, outside of Preston, where the very first human witnessed a transit. And astronomers gathered there to discuss the study of transits and to see it with their own eyes. The night before, I happened to be in a pub and uh, met a very lovely young woman. And I asked her, hey, do you want to come with me and see something no living human being has ever seen before? <laughs> Turns out it was a good pickup line. Anita and I went out for two years, and we're still very good friends. <laughs> Transits can be more important than just for my social life, however, because they can also tell us how big a planet is relative to its plan uh, parent star and tell us about its atmosphere. And here's an example of real data collected with Canada's Space Telescope of the transit of a planet. So, currently there are 547 exoplanets confirmed, discovered through this Doppler technique, and 1,200 candidates, mostly provided by NASA's Kepler mission. 
which has been measuring the dips that occur when planets pass in front of stars out of a sample of 170,000 stars that it's monitoring. Kepler's a space telescope, but when you think of space telescopes, this is the one everybody thinks of, the Hubble Space Telescope, America's very successful space telescope. Let me show you Canada's space telescope side by side. There we go. That's officially most. Microvariability and oscillation of stars, microvariability, a oscillation stellaire, perfect Canadian acronym. But because of this comparison, <laughs> we have nicknamed it the Humble Space Telescope. <laughs> and I should also point out that after launch, uh, it was discovered that our telescope resembles a famous celebrity, and so sometimes we're obliged by copyright to call it Space Telescope Square Pants. <laughs> what most is, is an ultra-precise light meter in space that can see changes in the brightnesses of stars down to one part in a million, one ten-thousandth of a percent. Even astronomers have a hard time wrapping their head around a change that small. And if astronomers do, you can bet that federal government bureaucrats that you're approaching for funding have a problem. And so I had to come up with a way to put this in terms that regular non-rocket scientists could understand. Imagine going to New York City at night and looking at the Empire State Building. All the office lights are on, all the window shades are completely open. You could make the Empire State Building fainter by one ten thousandth of a percent by having one person stand at one window and pull down one shade by three centimeters, a little more than an inch. And if they moved it up and down, they would make the Empire State Building flicker at an amplitude of one part per million in brightness. That's what our space telescope is capable of measuring. So, back to the headlines. Tiny space telescope reveals super Earth hitting the news. It hit the news yesterday. And I should point out that the, the unsung heroine of this news story is Becky Dawson, a Harvard PhD student who was the one who basically gave us the clue to say we should point Canada's Space Telescope in a particular direction. Here's the roadmap to this exotic super-Earth, the direction that Becky suggested we should point. And we put a star called 55 Cancri A in the constellation of Cancer under the astronomical equivalent of a police stakeout for two weeks, looking for a planet. And we found it. And here's the signal. There's the dip due to the planet passing in front of its parent star. Very subtle dip. How subtle? One fiftieth of a percent. And here's a family portrait, a simulated family portrait, of the sun as it would appear from outside the solar system if the Earth and Jupiter passed in front of it, and it, they do if, uh, for alien astronomers if they're out there, and 55 Cancri A, almost a twin to the sun, and this planet, 55 Cancri E. So there's the fingerprint of the planet, but that also is telling us the time it takes the planet to go around the star. 17 hours and 41 minutes. That's its year. You want to make a date on this planet? Don't use a calendar, use a wristwatch. Let's put it into the big picture. If you want to understand human beings, you want to look at a big sample of humans from across the planet. And here's just a small subset at the corner of Robson and Burrard in the city of Vancouver on a nice uh, shopping weekend. And if there were an alien anthropologist on Earth, that anthropologist could make measurements of things like uh, weight and height of the humans studied non-invasively. And here is what that anthropologist would find. And you can see that it's just not a random correlation. There are correlations between weight and height and between the genders and a function of age as well. There can be outliers in the distribution, things that don't quite fit that standard trend. Uh, the ones to the lower uh, right, uh, those are supermodels. Uh, the ones to the upper left, those are sumo wrestlers. Well, a humanist astrophysicist like myself on Earth can do the same thing with planets around other stars, except instead of weight and height, it's mass and radius. And here's what we found. Here are all of the planets around other stars and some of the ones around our own star in our solar system, for which we have masses and radii. 
And there's the Earth, and there's Jupiter, and there's 55 Cancri E. And it's, it's sitting in a very interesting place. If we zoom in on it, we find it's twice as dense as lead. And if you compare it to the other fairly massive and small planets, it's really massive and it's surprisingly small. So it's essentially a sumo wrestler in the body of a super Earth supermodel. It's an outlier. Here is just some of the parameters that we have been able to measure in a week. This is in the week since we discovered it and the accuracies. I don't expect you to look at all those numbers, but for myself, I don't think I could come up with as many numbers and as accurate numbers as this about myself. And, and we know this planet in many ways, and there are the, some of the team members that contributed to this. So I could actually give 55 Cancri E a passport. Uh, you know, we know enough about it. Speaking of parameter space, here's a plot of the depth of that dip in light for these different transiting planets and the brightness of the parent star in a system that astronomers use called magnitude. It's a logarithmic system where kind of bass backwards, where smaller numbers represent brighter stars. Look, 55 Cancri E is a loner sitting all by itself. And in this particular plot, that's important not just to astronomers, but I think it's important to all of you as well. Because where that sits, means you can see that star, not the planet, but you can see that star without a telescope, with the naked eye. In fact, tonight, you could walk out of this building and look up in the southwest at around 10 p.m., and you could see this star. And when you point to it, you can tell somebody it has a planet around it, this big, this massive, this temperature, you know, that maybe has an atmosphere. And that's the first time that we've ever been able to do that. It's like something Captain Kirk would do in an old Star Trek episode when he was trying to woo an alien woman. He'd say, oh, look at that star. That has that planet around it. You know, the, what was science fiction when I was a kid is becoming science fact. And so why look for other planets? It's basically to understand our world and really to appreciate it better. Thank you for your attention.